Normal mode analysis plays a major role in dynamics. It's a study of how an elastic structure would vibrate if left to its own devices, that is, without external forces. This plays an important role in characterizing the structure in terms of its stiffness and density, and it can also be used as a building block tool to solve more complicated force problems. I'll go through some of the physical description first, then we'll look at the mathematical characterization. We'll use a beam as an example and show that its modes are orthogonal, and we will introduce some definitions of the orthonormal modes. Uh, we'll talk about positive definiteness and some other mathematical concepts. Uh, Rayleigh's quotient is used for a quick estimate of the lowest frequency of a structure. We'll end with a problem session. We'll start with a physical interpretation of normal modes. These are self-sustained oscillations that occur at specific natural frequencies. The word natural uh, takes the proper technical usage the same as street usage, that it's natural for the body to vibrate at that frequency. It's due to a balance of uh, the internal inertia and stiffness forces. It's not dependent on some kind of external forcing frequency. You can characterize such self-sustained oscillations with a sine function or a cosine function or the uh, exponential complex form. It depends on how complicated the problem is. If it's an undamped problem, as we often d use in our normal mode, sometimes the sine functions are sufficient. If you get a general formulation, you typically would need the complex exponential to handle the uh, out-of-phase uh, quantities. I've shown here some normal modes for a cantilever beam. You see a shape involved in each case, and that shape is actually an envelope of a vibration amplitude in which the points on the body would move back and forth harmonically. A beam, for instance, moves normal to its initial axis. The second mode would likewise look something like this when you plot the envelope, and the third mode something like that. Now the mode shape and the frequency go together. There will be here a certain frequency, call it omega 1, and a mode shape which we later will call phi 1 of x. Here there would be a second uh, frequency, omega 2, a third frequency, omega 3. Now the mode shapes and the frequencies depend on the geometry of the problem, the materials, the boundary conditions, and perhaps other uh, conditions. You may have, uh, under the geometry uh, category, you might have wrinkles or, or uh, darts and pleats and all kinds of stiffening tricks that people use on sheet metal. Or you might have added masses somewhere that would slow the system down. I'm going to show you a physical example um, in the video inset before the next figure. A few minutes ago I walked out in the consulting areas of automated analysis and swiped a small ruler from one of our consulting engineers. I'm speaking to you from the automated analysis headquarters in Ann Arbor and we have about 40 people in this building doing all kinds of finite element work. Uh, anyway, here's his ruler. And as you flip the end of it, you see that there's a relatively slow motion here. Uh, the frequency that is uh, the natural frequency depends on how I clamp the end, the material, and then how long this is. Let me show the effect of shortening the length. Notice the frequency is getting a little higher, faster, faster, until now it starts getting into the acoustic range. Let me take shorter and shorter segments. So I think you can tell that the frequency of that beam definitely depends on the length. Let's talk about some other examples. 
Um, musicians are well aware of the reeds that are in musical instruments and tuning forks that give uh, certain specific frequencies. In the scientific area, you have crystals and watches, and you have electric uh, devices like electronic counters. Usually, there's a quartz crystal, and the useful frequency might have to be uh, found by some frequency reduction and some kind of a division of the frequencies involved. Uh, those quartz crystals have very high natural frequencies, perhaps uh, uh, hundreds of uh, kilohertz. Large buildings like the Empire State Building have a fundamental mode in which the upper stories move through a rather large uh, motion, large in the sense of perhaps a half a foot or a foot, uh, small in terms of the total scale of the building, but that's still sufficient to make some people a little bit seasick up at the top of the uh, structure. Then there are window panes and other objects around us. In fact, I used to uh, have a demonstration in my vibration classes where I would bring in a Bentley proximeter and an oscilloscope. And by putting aluminum foil on various surfaces around the room, you could prove that everything around us is moving at all times. Window panes, uh, doors, desks, lights, everything is sitting in a constant state of motion. The amplitudes tend to range from a half of a thousandth of an inch peak to peak down to uh, oh, a tenth of a thousandth peak to peak, but very measurable, each one typically um, vibrating in a fundamental mode. So normal modes are around us all the time, and there are even some um, human uh, modes such as that, such as the twitter of the human eye as it observes something. The eye gathers information partly by bright and dark areas having a boundary, and then the eye, by uh, vibrating, will have some of the rods and cones that are going from light to dark, light to dark, or red to green, red to green, and, and that helps the eye define that uh, area. Okay, the mathematics of the normal mode problem are generally studied with real eigenvalue analysis. That's what we're going to do by neglecting damping. But it is possible to go into complex eigenvalue analysis as well. There you might put damping back in. You might add fluids that cause out-of-phase forces that have the appearance of damping, inertia, uh, stiffness even. You can have gyroscopic and Coriolis forces. And then in more recent times, artificial control of structures is starting to add forces that might be out of phase with the dominant displacement. The terminology in the eigenvalue problem is interesting. The German word for eigenvalue is eigenwerte, and uh, the American equivalent or English equivalent really should be characteristic value. But to give it a little bit of a nice flair, we, we use one German word and one English word, so we call it eigenvalue. Uh, other um, cross use of terms uh, that I've picked up over my career is that what we once called natural modes, we now call normal modes. And the word free vibration can really mean one of two things, either the uh, undiminished normal modes themselves, that motion that continues with time, or the response to initial conditions. Uh, in other words, a transient problem that has no loading on it so that it's free. But the um, thing that's uh, not clear if this is standing alone is whether there are damping forces and whether this is really a response to initial conditions or is it the continuing motion, the so-called normal mode motion. But I think from the context, people will tell uh, what is meant by free vibration. Now, the normal modes and natural frequencies are helpful in structural mechanics in two ways. One way is a pure characterization of the structure itself, because they do give you some feeling about the ratio of stiffness to mass of the system. Um, the first frequency, in particular, tells you a little bit about that overall system behavior. And then the shape tells you something about the way that the system is likely to move most easily. 
So when you know the first few natural frequencies and normal modes of a structure, you're already on the way toward defining the behavior of that structure. Um, this becomes less true when you have really complex bodies like an automobile, and it's not sufficient to understand the first three or four modes, but rather you need to get up higher into the mode spectrum to, to really see what's going on. One of the reasons is that there are more local localized effects, maybe something in the suspension that vibrates, and, and that might be the 12th or 23rd mode. Um, the advent of interest in quieting vehicles uh, brings in acoustics, and then some of those modes are substantially higher in the spectrum as well. But in any event, bottom line is, if you knew, knew the bottom 100 or so normal modes of a structure and the corresponding frequencies, you'd have a pretty good idea of what that structure was. Now, those modes are not just used for understanding. They're used in a practical way as a working tool, typically in a series approach, so, so as to expand a candidate solution to a response problem as a series of normal modes. More often, it's the spatial part of the problem there that's helpful. In other words, the, the mode shapes are used quite often. Because if this were a frequency response problem, let's say, then the frequency might more likely be determined by the external force field. Uh, now, nevertheless, both the mode shapes and the frequencies can appear in these response problems. I like to give a geometric interpretation of the eigenvalue problem because it builds intuition and it helps people remember a little of the detail. There really are two eigenvalue problems I want to consider, and one is called the special eigenvalue problem, and the other is called the general eigenvalue problem. Let's start with the special problem where you're given a matrix A, and the question is, is there a direction X in the space which the matrix A will map the vector X back into a collinear version of itself, possibly multiplied by a scale factor. So, Generally speaking, the matrix A will rotate the vector and either stretch or shrink it. This time we're asking, is there a special direction in which there is no rotation? And so over here on the sketch, I show the original trial vector, a black arrow, and the um, vector x direction in two dimensions. You might think of these dimensions now as being displacements in a body, perhaps u1 and u2. And then the question is, is there uh, such a preferred or characteristic direction that ax would lie collinear with x, as shown? Now in that case, you can see that ax is larger than x, and therefore this lambda value would have a number greater than 1. Lambda is, of course, the eigenvalue. Now, if A is a nice enough matrix, you will find two such directions in a two-dimensional space, so that there are two characteristic directions, or um, uh, eigenvectors. And uh, if A is nice enough, then sometimes those are orthogonal in the physical space. Uh, and there are other kinds of orthogonality that we'll discuss later as well. Now, the general eigenvalue problem is a little bit different. The question is, given A and B, two matrices, does the matrix A rotate a trial vector the same amount as B rotates that trial vector? And if so, then find a scale factor or an eigenvalue that will bring this equation into balance. So over here the question is, would this trial direction x, when um, ax rotates it this far and seems to expand it just slightly, then the bx rotates farther, uh, sorry, at the same rotation but expands it more, then apparently we can satisfy that equation. So it's a little different philosophy because the original physical direction here, or the physical vector, doesn't appear alone in the final answer, but rather uh, has been mapped 
twice into some new pair of vectors. And you see in the vibration problem then, this is like the displacement vector, and these are like the, perhaps, the inertia forces and the um, stiffness forces here on the left, and those must align. In this figure, I'd like to combine the terms in a little different way than our geometric interpretation earlier. For instance, in this general eigenvalue problem here, I've put the two operators on the left side along with the eigenvalue. Now the question becomes, can this general operator here map a vector into the zero vector? So this is a nulling operation. We could broaden our definition of the eigenvalue problem to be this set of terms, uh, mathematically a constant term, a linear term, and a quadratic term, and ask that same question. I like to include this because this is often relevant for the damped vibration problem or the problem with uh, Coriolis effects and gyroscopic effects and so on. Let me put down the structural notation in this pair of equations where we would recognize this, uh, what was once an A matrix up here is really the stiffness matrix, and then the matrix that has the eigenvalue appearing is the mass matrix. Phi is a symbol given for the, the eigenvector when you've taken the time dependence out. So these are generally spatial terms that are displacements of the structure at nodes in our case. But again, asking whether this combined matrix, sometimes called the dynamical matrix, will uh, map the uh, proposed set of displacements here into the zero vector. Then we can generalize that into the problem that has not only stiffness and, and mass, but also damping terms. All of these above equations fall in the form of a dynamical matrix times a proposed answer being mapped into the null vector. And uh, I think this interpretation has an advantage in some special cases. There's times when you try to drive error to zero, and you might think of this vector on the right-hand side as an error vector, which you would like to be zero, and you might find methods that work on that and try to drive it to zero. These would be approximate methods or iterative methods. In the classical study of differential equations and integral equations, Fred Holm used to distinguish between different kinds of solution types. Those were called the four Fred Holm alternatives. I like to use that same idea here in our matrix problem. You have perhaps a problem in this form, and right now I'm thinking of it as a linear set of equations that are algebraic, in other words, a matrix uh, linear algebraic problem. The dynamical matrix here would map the displacement vector into another vector over here. We might think of the y as the forcing function on the problem, and then x as the response. The, the four permutations result from the fact that either the determinant of the coefficients of that dynamical matrix are zero, or they are not. And likewise, either there is an external force present, or there is not, over on this side. So the four combinations are found by taking one of the two alternatives on the left, one of the two alternatives on the right. Now, the one that we're interested in today is called the eigenvalue problem, and that's where you have the determinant of the matrix equal to zero, and there's no external force on the system. Another possibility would be the determinant to be zero, but there would actually be a force on it. Now that's pathological because your determinant of this matrix being zero says that there's a singularity, and in our terms that means there's a kind of uh, displacement field that has no natural resistance to motion. 
in the dynamic sense, that's a normal mode. And if you put a if you put a force field on the system that tries to excite that kind of motion, you'll get a singular answer. So we generally try not to solve this problem in this class. There's only one application I know where this pathological case of, is of interest, and that's in the sensitivities for eigenvectors. But that's very high level work. Now the other two alternatives come when the structure is a conventional stable structure and either there's no load on it, in which case you get the trivial solution that there's no displacement, or there is a load on it, in which case you get the standard uh, stress uh, or uh, response problem. The interesting one that we're interested in is this eigenvalue problem where the matrix has seemingly some weaknesses in some displacement directions, but there's no force on the system. And so you really have the, the opposite of an irresistible force meeting an immovable object because now we have a system that's uh, incredibly weak in certain uh, displacement patterns, but you don't have any force on it. And so it's going to vibrate on its own without any external force in those so-called weak directions. I'm going to do a numerical example just to get us into the mathematics of the eigenvalue problem. I'm going to pick a clamp-clamp beam shown here and model it with two finite elements. We'll make some assumptions on the problem, namely that this is a slender bar and has a square, which is a compact cross-section. That means that the Euler-Bernoulli theory will apply. It's constrained to move only up and down in the xy plane, so I'm not interested in torsional and axial motion, nor bending out of that plane in the xz direction. The resulting motion will be what I'm going to call pure flexural motion. Let's suppose that our goal is to find the first two natural frequencies uh, and their corresponding mode shapes for this flexure in the xy plane. The um, accuracy of those two modes would be in question. Rayleigh many years ago said that you needed to have twice as many degrees of freedom in the system as you are going to receive accurate answers for the eigenvalues. And so historically there's always been a tendency then to carry twice as many degrees of freedom as you're interested in engineering accuracy. This problem is going to be a little bit strange in that we can't apply that rule directly because there are Two, going to be two degrees of freedom at the left end, two at the middle, two at the right, and there's a total of six degrees of freedom. Yet those degrees of freedom at the boundaries are clamped, and, and there's some question, are those real degrees of freedom or not? So we'll check that out at the end of the problem and uh, try not to draw too many false conclusions from the answer because we know that it's a bit hard to interpret in this case. I like to point out the physical modeling ideas first and then follow with finite element modeling. And uh, that has been a practice of mine since talking with Jerry Joseph years ago at McNeil Schwindler, where he said that fully half of his questions from the field in his role as a uh, consultant to the industry had to do with the physical nature of the problem. Was it a beam or was it a plate? In other words, engineering mechanics. So I try to separate out the engineering mechanics from the uh, finite element questions. This beam is slender. As I've drawn it, it's much more than 10 to 1 aspect ratio of length to uh, height. Uh, we'll neglect any damping. We won't include any external forces. Clearly, it's a clamp boundary condition at each end, which will constrain both rotations and translations there. And the deflection that we're interested in, we will label V of X. So this is a deflection in the Y coordinate. And it's a deflection of the neutral axis. Our finite element model now as we go into finite element uh, approximations is a two element model. There will be both a translation and a rotation at each of the three nodes. 
There is no axial motion implied, which would be a column action. Uh, we're interested only in this lateral flexure. The mass matrix we worked out in an earlier lecture and our stiffness matrix came from earlier work in linear static finite element theory. I'm going to be free to put in the boundary conditions at the left and the right end, specifying zero acceleration there and zero displacement there. Those are the points where I don't know what the reaction forces are. I'm going to follow a convention that I've used in, in my engineering teaching with uh, mechanical engineers and aerospace engineers, that I'm going to put live loads and reaction loads together in this vector on the right side. These are the reaction forces actually above and below at the fixed degrees of freedom and then these two locations would be where the live loads would have been applied had we wanted them. Civil engineers are a little more careful in their bookkeeping and often have two vectors where they separate out the live loads and the reaction loads. But I think in most mechanical engineering problems and, and aerospace and, and many other fields, putting those together does not do a disservice and it's easy to uh, uncouple those uh, ideas. So we know that when you post multiply a matrix by a vector that these zeros tend to cancel columns in the matrix and so you might as well cancel those terms and forget them in any resulting multiplications. Secondly, since there are no unknowns in these locations, we will partition out the remaining equations. The first equation, the second equation are merely set aside. And with these zero terms here, there's no coupling then uh, between those two equations uh, that prevents us from solving. There is some coupling in a, in, in a one-way direction that maybe we can discuss later. So basically by partitioning out the first, second, um, fifth and sixth equations, you're left with relations that involve this interior set of terms. And those are repeated on the next page. So reaching back into earlier lecture material, we have the actual symbolic terms shown here. We're left with the accelerations at the interior node that has two degrees of freedom and the displacements at that interior node. Um, this is a bit of a special problem because of symmetry and we find a fortuitous simplification that these uh, off-diagonal terms cancel there and there. The way that I would say then uh, to discuss this situation is that there is inertial uncoupling here and lo and behold, the same thing happens on the elastic coupling terms, that this term vanishes as well as this one. Now that's unusual. It's helpful here because it simplifies the math, but it's not the general case. More generally, your uh, degrees of freedom that you've chosen, which are physical degrees of freedom at nodes, would be coupled to each other in, in all ways, inertially and elastically. But the simplified equation that we get is shown below here. Some of you might recognize then that these equations directly uncouple and they could be solved uh, as two standalone scalar equations. But I want to carry along the matrix concept. So the zeros appear and we've done some collection of terms and a bit of simplification. We have now a set of linear, ordinary differential equations in time. There are two variables. We might change this from a second order differential equation into an equation of constant coefficients by assuming harmonic motion. And this effectively removes the time variable. We do that by assuming that those interior coordinates move harmonically with this complex exponential behavior. Then phi 3 and phi 4, where the indices are inside the vector uh, symbol, mean that these are components phi 3 and phi 4 in degrees of freedom 3 and 4. I put that expression into the differential equation and you find that the derivatives on time bring out this i omega squared quantity. 
we're left with the e to the i omega t as a common factor, and we don't want to uh, call, let that cause the equation to be brought into balance. We want this equation rather to be true for all times. So we just cancel that term and don't allow it to zero out the left side. Then we collect terms shown below here and start um, collecting the important frequency dependent terms in this quantity, which we'll call the eigenvalue. In the next figure, I'll, I will do a bit more of consolidation and handling these coefficients and simplifying them. We will do the simplification of the equations by dividing out constants in a way to make the mass matrix simple. You have a bit of a choice. Do you want the stiffness matrix to be really simple or the mass? And often it's done in this way. Um, here we're able to put units on the main diagonal, which is a uh, kind of a standard way to scale a problem. The frequency content is involved in this eigenvalue. Uh, the displacement field that's proposed is here. This would correspond to the, the static values that define the envelope of the uh, normal mode. The real question is whether you can bring this system into balance or not. And so we have that uh, second form of the problem where we emphasize that there was a dynamical matrix attempting to map a proposed vector into the zero vector. Now, we can uh, put the terms together because matrix uh, addition can be handled this way and uh, see that on the main diagonals there are terms that have both uh, inertia and structural stiffness properties in them. Again, we're still asking, is there a dynamical, uh, for this dynamical matrix here, is there a direction here that can be mapped into zero? Now, the only parameter you have to adjust is the eigenvalue lambda. And when you pick a value of lambda as a candidate eigenvalue, you have to put it into both equations because this is a uh, set of equations that must be satisfied for whatever mode shape and frequency that you arrive at. Now, there will be more than one answer, which is the interesting thing and makes this different from the common response problem. Not only are there more than one answer, but there are two classes of answers here, and one of which is the trivial class of answer where we just take the uh, displacement field to be zero, and we say that, well, this matrix will map zero into zero at any frequency you'd like. Well, that's not too much fun. That's like kissing your sister. So um, although this is important to know, it's not useful. The other class of possible solutions, which has subcase solutions within it, is that the determinant of the matrix is zero, but that uh, now the phi vector has to take a certain peculiar characteristic direction to satisfy the problem. And of course, that's the normal mode that we're looking for. I like to use the word shape because many people, when they first look at this problem, just don't get it that this phi is a matrix of displacements throughout the body that helps define the envelope of vibration. And these are constants, but they are actually amplitudes of the vibration that tell the shape in which the structure is vibrating. The condition for a set of linear algebraic equations to have a solution when there's a zero right-hand side is that the determinant of the coefficients of the matrix must be zero. Now that determinant in our case would be uh, the diagonal terms times each other uh, minus the off-diagonal terms. Those are zero, so you get this simple expression. This is already in a factorized form. There is no need to go further. We immediately see that if lambda takes either the value 32 here or the value 420 here, that you will satisfy the balance of forces. I've had students in my uh, exams, in particular in the past, that will find this characteristic equation. We'll multiply it out, and then we'll use the quadratic formula to find what the roots are. And they don't understand that when you've already factorized equation, that's already it. Those are the zero crossings of that function. If you think of this as a function of lambda, are already given to you when it's factorized. But I'd say typically a quarter of the class will do that if they're put under extreme stress. 
Um, so what you must do is look at these one at a time as candidate solutions. Lambda 1 of 32.3. We go to the equation set here, put the eigenvalue into both locations where it appears, and then ask if there is a feed direction that works. Well, the first equation vanishes, so you don't get any condition on phi 3. In other words, phi 3 is arbitrary. The second equation, however, says the 387 times phi 4 is 0, or in other words, phi 4 has to be 0. So you're left with the interesting solution that at this non-dimensional frequency ratio here, that if you draw a shape as shown where the body oscillates back and forth between these two positions, that if there's no slope, which is phi 4 as a rotational degree of freedom, uh, and this merely translates nice, nicely and symmetrically up and down, that, that is the so-called first mode of vibration. Let me summarize the results from that first eigenvalue and eigenvector calculation. The eigenvalue here, which was a uh, frequency term basically with frequency squared appearing in it uh, was 33.2 and we could recover the physical quantities from that knowing the uh, beam properties. Here you have the eigenvector which is the shape and rather than take an arbitrary amplitude for phi 3 up above, I'm taking a unit value, and that's often done to scale the eigenvector such that it has a unit value in its largest coordinate. The one that appears outside these curly braces shows that this is the first eigenvector. It does, of course, have two components inside the braces. Now you find the second eigenvalue the same way. Um, the number that we found from the so-called characteristic equation or characteristic polynomial that was factorized was 420. So we put 420 back into the combined equations. Uh, interestingly, this time it says that um, phi 4 has no uh, condition on it since the equation results in 0 equals 0. So uh, this component down here, shown in normalized form, really is arbitrary in size. The first equation, though, said that phi 3 had to be 0, and so that appears here. Now this is then the second eigenvector with the two appearing outside the curly braces, and it looks like this figure here. Now, again, this is just the um, envelope of the kind of motion that would occur. 